Good morning, all. Appreciate everybody being here this morning. Time for us to uh, get going on our class period this morning. This quarter, we've tackled uh, the topic of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I uh, appreciate your continued prayer in that effort. And uh, this morning, particularly, we're talking about, and, I, and in my judgment, this is one of the most important classes of the quarter, because it's one I know that I have overlooked, um, and that is, what does the Old Testament tell us about the Spirit coming in the New Testament? What was prophesied? I don't know that before I dug into this story, or into this study, I had ever spent any time evaluating these passages about what, what did the first century Jews expect, or what should they have expected about the coming of the Holy Spirit in a, in a different way. Um, based on what they were told uh, by the Old Testament prophets. So we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning, and I hope you find that, hope you find that worthwhile. Boy, the verse of the day is Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Uh, Romans 5, 5. Try to pick a verse about the Spirit. Every class kind of frame my, um, my thoughts. Hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And I, and I choose that verse for a reason, because I'm going to say something unusual to hear in a Bible class, is, is, what, is what is my primary motivation through the rest of this class? We've been up to this point kind of talking about the, I don't know what you call it, the nuts and bolts. We call it eating our vegetables, kind of the, the understanding of who the Spirit is what in general his role has been in the Old and New Testament. But now we get into uh, some application of that in the, in the rest of the class. And I would say that I approach this rest of this class with a lot of humility. I love you guys. And we are going to have some different opinions on this. We just are. There's, we've got different perspectives, different backgrounds. We're going we're to see some of this in different ways. I come with no superiority. I do not have this figured out. And I hope that we all come with a lot of humility that we're going to try to just read what the verses say, do our best to understand the application that these New Testament writers, what the Holy Spirit was trying to tell us about himself. Um, and so love does not, you know, if we got love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, as it says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, we're going to approach this in a certain way. And that's, that's going to be my intent. Uh, I... I do not have the high ground here intellectually to tell you all what this says. We're going to try to read the verses together and, and make the best sense of it that we can. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask Brother Ron to lead us in an opening word of prayer. And we're going to dive into some of these Old Testament prophecies. Ron, do you mind? Amen. Thank you. Would anyone like a copy of what we're going over this morning? Uh, at least the, the verses will be there for you. Anyone else? Anyone else need? I think I got them one. Huh? Okay, so there are 10 passages listed, I and mean, we won't have time this morning to read all those in detail. We will turn to, to several of them. There are 10 passages listed on this page. 
again, I'm not sure that's exhaustive, but the best I can was able to reason out and search out, this is the 10 places, you could argue for a couple more perhaps, this is 10 places in the Old Testament that there was a promise of something coming in the future regarding the Holy Spirit. And so I hope that you had time to look at these verses and study them. Um, and I, I'm going to kind of just open it up as we start. Did you notice any themes? Any, if, if you, you know, I've already <laughs> been over this class. I think in categories, if, anybody, if you categorize these, just give me your first thoughts about reading these verses, uh, reading these passages in, in the context of this study, what struck you or what themes did you see? Anyone got any thoughts or comments there? Okay, we're going off the deep end early. It's early. But we're going to go off the deep end. Okay. I'm old. I'm old. We don't, okay, you're old. Okay. The ones that prophesied the Holy Spirit coming in, in the Old Testament, did they always come with, with a reference to? Okay, so I think Carol makes an excellent point early. Is there is a there's a portion of these verses, no question, that talk about the Spirit coming with a coming servant, or a coming branch, or a coming king. There's a whole section of these verses that that kind of fall into that. Again, if you allow me to use, I, I'm thinking categories that that fall into that category. Um, if you'll note, Isaiah chapter 11, I believe, kind of falls into that category. Uh, the Spirit will rest on Him, and He will judge with righteousness, and will kind of usher in this kingdom of peace. Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 61, I, I, at least I, I kind of set those all off into a category of, of their own, where it talked about the Spirit coming with a coming servant, or a coming branch, or a coming king. Um, anything particularly noteworthy about those passages? Let's talk about those first. Um, Car- well, let's first answer Carol's question. Carol asked the question, are the verses that talk about the coming Holy Spirit absent from a coming servant, or a coming king, or a coming branch? Anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Ezekiel 39. Yeah. One stands out. Concept of the, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 37. 36 and 7, I would yeah, say, yeah. 36 and 37. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. Just, it's, it's the people that are being changed, not necessarily talking about the leader that's going to come along with that. Yes. So I'm, I'm glad we. Is it the people then? Those people then are going to be changed. Not Messiah coming. Good question. So the question is, are we talking about, are the Old Testament writers talking about a change in people in their day or a change in people in a future day? So we're going to put a pin in that. We'll come back to that question, Ms. Carroll. Uh, I want to touch on first, and I'm glad we kind of touched on or, or getting to this point first. There's definitely a section here talking about a spirit coming with a future person, a future servant. And then we got this other section that says we're going to, we're going to talk about the spirit coming in everyone. Um, and that, that, I think that's crucial. So carving off these passages first, the kind of uh, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 61, anything particularly noteworthy? We're going to spend a whole class talking about um, prophecies about Christ and the Spirit being on Christ. I think actually our next lesson is a whole lesson on that topic specifically. But anything just as you read those passages preparing for today that you thought was interesting or noteworthy that you'd like to share with the class? Yes. 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 So John makes the point, and I'll try to repeat that for the sake of both the, the video and, and those that may not have heard it. 
It's important to note that when we're talking about the promised spirit, in this whole class we're talking about the promised spirit. That's a, it's an idea that Paul talks about in Galatians, the spirit that was promised. It is not as if, as we've already studied, it is not as if that God promised his spirit and so he created the spirit when Jesus arrived so that the spirit could aid in this future, right? That doesn't, that doesn't wash with everything we've already studied. The spirit is eternal. The spirit is God. He was there at the beginning. He was part of creation. And so when, when we were talking about the promised spirit, we're talking about just the spirit in a, in a new and perhaps more prominent role. Um, prim- first, it appears, uh, I'm applying some New Testament logic to this, but there's a section where, where it talks about the Spirit coming in a new and different and more prominent way within being poured on or, or being on this servant that is coming. And, and, and then there's also this section, and again, we know, and, and John says, putting this, our kind of New Testament knowledge to work here, we know that that after the coming of that servant, then the Holy Spirit has an even more prominent role in the lives of, of believers um, on all flesh, on all a new heart, a new spirit. Um, I don't, w- one thing that I noted, again, if you look at this from a perspective of a first century Jew, or better yet, a first century BC Jew, right? Would it have been clear? that the servant comes first and then the Spirit is poured out on all people. What do we think about that? Is there any reason, like, we, we, we kind of put that in that order because our understanding of the Gospels and the book of Acts. I'm not, I'm not sure how a, an, old, uh, an Old Testament believing, you know, Bible-believing Jew would have understood that. Any, any thoughts or anybody that... Anybody have that thought as they were studying these passages? Yes. Yes. Um, well, again, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a whole class talking about the way the, the Spirit came in, in the Jesus. I think there have been a number of surprising things to a believing Jew about the Spirit coming on this servant. Um, this combination of things that Jesus, the combination of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled would have been surprising. That he would have been both the suffering servant and the king that was going to set up a kingdom, and the Messiah, the fact that all of that was wrapped into one person, I think would have been very surprising to your, um, to your kind of Old Testament Bible-believing Jew. But that's exactly what we see. Um, we'll talk more about that in, in our next class. The son, yeah, this, this son of Jesse, which has this idea of kingship, right? Um, that then we get that idea that, that this is the king that's going to bring in, that he's going to usher in, this is Isaiah 11, he's going to usher in this kingdom of peace, this time of peace, um, get this very kind of earthly kingdom, kind of peaceful kingdom idea from that. But you also get this servant who is going to have the spirit on him who is going to cleanse them, which was a priestly idea. And the, the merging of all that together, again, would have been difficult to comprehend without the New Testament um, giving us the context around it. Yes? Connected with the idea of the king and and maybe with the idea of a a priest. Uh, They would have heard words that stood out to them such as justice. Yes. Justice. Yes. Uh, That word shows up two or three times in these passages, by the way, to, to, to Kyle's point. Justice. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 42... And, and as you point out, Isaiah 61 also, they would have most likely read these passages thinking, look at the specific ways. Why are we brokenhearted? Well, we're brokenhearted because Jerusalem is in turmoil. And we don't have a king on the throne. We certainly don't have one that's wise and understanding and knowledgeable, a mighty leader. When you think about the, the, the leaders of Jerusalem at that day. So they would have heard these and thought about, this, this king that's coming, the spirit-filled king, 
He's going to he's going to change things for us. Yes. So there is this section. I don't want to spend too much time on these because I think the 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 other section deserves a lot of our attention. But there is this section of scriptures that talk about there is going to be a king like David or a king in the line of David who is going to come with the spirit of God in in a in a to that point unknown measure. He's going to have the spirit on him in a way that is going to be higher and greater than than even the prophets. Um, and, and to Kyle's point, I'll note, and this is just for your own study to think about, consistently one of the things that's noted with this coming king is a time of justice and a time of justice for the poor, specifically in, in, in uh, Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 61. This is good news to the poor. This is justice to the poor. Uh, I think that is interesting and significant, but there's going to be this coming king with the Spirit um, that would bring this time of justice and righteousness and peace. Um, and we got that, that is promised uh, primarily in the book of Isaiah. Any, any kind of closing thoughts on that section, that category of verses? Yes. Yes. So, and I think we talk about that passage next class, John. In, in, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus quotes directly Isaiah 61. It, it says, today this has been filled in your hearing. Uh, the Spirit has come on me to pronounce, you know, uh, for the poor and, and justice. All, the, all those things that are talked about in Isaiah 61. Okay, so we've, we've talked about that. The, the Spirit is coming in that way. That's prophesied. All right, now let's take this other chunk of verses. Um, and, and I'm talking about, let, let's read a few of them. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 32. Because some of these verses appear to talk about the coming of the Spirit in a different way. Not in this coming king in the line of David, but in a way that would have been unique. Isaiah chapter 32, I know in the passage it says 9 through 20. I'm just going to read a couple of those verses. Isaiah continually prophesies about Jerusalem. Is, there is a coming judgment on Jerusalem. That, that's a theme throughout Isaiah. Um, but there's, there's a couple of times that after that judgment, judgment is going to, is, is going to be in place until something happens. Okay? Um, 14 through 16, somebody care to read those verses? Isaiah 32, 14 through 16. As Wendell would say, not everybody at once will cause a commotion here. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask us to strip away what we know about the New Testament. Read this just as it's written in its context. Tell me what you see that you think is interesting. What, what, is, what is being promised here? What do you note? Yes, there is a renewal. I don't know if that's the right word. There's a rejuvenation. Um, what, I would also know there's a whole section here that we're going to talk about where it talks about the Spirit being poured. I think that's significant in itself. The Spirit, the, the, the way that the, whole, the Holy Spirit defines Himself, the way that he, the Bible writers talk about this is the Holy Spirit being poured. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, there's going to be a desolation. There's going to be difficulty until... The Spirit is poured out. And the effect of that, as Kyle said, renewal, regeneration, life, fruitful, um, ve fruitful vegetation. I, I, don't, I don't believe that even in the Old Testament, the, the readers would have understood that as saying, well, it, it, agriculturally, this is going to be fantastic, right? That's not the point. This is not about, this is not about fruit, but about the, they probably would have understood it, the nation, this, this 
this kingdom from a spiritual and, and a physical way in their minds has been devastated until, until the Spirit is poured, on, poured out from on high and there is renewal, rejuvenation, there's life, there is the return of uh, prosperity um, and fruitfulness. Right? Yeah. That is one of the functions of the Holy Spirit, no question. I think that readers in the Old Testament would have understood that. Yes? And, you know, they would have, they would have very much linked together the idea of physical prosperity to spiritual prosperity. You read the book of Job. You obviously have sinned because you've become poor, you're sick, your family has died. It's, it's all connected in their mind. Yeah. And the curses of God, they're, they're upon the land for your unfaithfulness. And so I think while predominantly they would have viewed this in a, a physical blessing, it was an indication of a spiritual relationship. Well said. Okay. Are there any other passages that kind of mirror that idea from Isaiah 32? Any other passages in our, in our list there that have a similar theme? So in a sense, Ezekiel 39 okay. talks about uh, maybe not necessarily the idea of fruitfulness, but it talks about the idea of security, of things that are being gathered back and, and this idea of rebuilt or refreshed, we're gathered back to the nation. We're no longer in fear. We finally have security. Yes. But I think you know, Ezekiel 39 may, may play into that some, but also Isaiah 44. Yeah, so a uh, note both those. We'll come back to Isaiah 44. Ezekiel 39, if you turn there, that, that passage from verse 25 through the end of the chapter kind of talks about the state that they're in, but verse 39 specifically, again, the Spirit will be poured out and, and there's going to be a restoration. I will not hide my face from them. I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord. There, there is going to be, again, this idea of renewal, restoration, um, bring back from fear, bring back from hopelessness, a renewal of uh, a sense of hope and peace. When the, when the Spirit is poured out. That's, that's Ezekiel 39. We'll come to Isaiah 44 next. Annie? Yes. 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 Yeah, so there's, and in, in, in some of these in the Old Testament, again, I think in categories, so I apologize for those that don't, I'm probably not being helpful here. But there's, there's a section where it talks about the Spirit being poured out, and there's a section that talks about putting a new Spirit into people. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that because I think that is important in that context. It also, I would note in, in Ezekiel 30, 36, where Annie just was, it also talks about, I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, and you'll never again suffer the disgrace of famine. That is when there is a new heart and a new spirit. That, that idea of um, the, the return of life, the return of fruitfulness, the rejuvenation life, that is, that, that is embedded in that, in that context also. It says later in that same verse that the desolate will become like the Garden of Eden. Yes, thank you. I, I was looking for that verse and couldn't find it. 35, yeah, the, uh, what has been desolate will become like the Garden of Eden. Like that, that dramatic renewal, um, the, the change from the desolate to the fruitful as of the Garden of Eden. Okay. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. So try to repeat your comment for, for sake of everyone. Ro Roger's comment is obviously very important as we think about the impact of these promises to us is that God is revealing these ideas in physical ways, but in a lot of ways this is like a parable, right? That this is, this is our understanding of this has to be spiritual, if we're spiritual people, that this rejuvenation, this life, this going from desolate to fruitful, that all of that is, is meaningful to us in a spiritual way. Um, and I hope I did justice to that comment. But, but I think that's important as we, think, as we think through all of that. Let's turn to Isaiah 44. Uh, Kyle referenced that. This is, again, a very similar idea to what we saw in Isaiah 32. Isaiah 44, the first few verses, again, this idea of pouring, we're in this, um, this, by the way, verse 1, that jeshurun, if I understand that, that, that's a very affectionate term for, only used in the book of Deuteronomy, kind of this affectionate term for Israel, I will pour out water on thirsty land. And streams upon dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. I think there, Roger, is where we get the clearest connection. Like this pouring of water on thirsty ground isn't about agriculture. It's, that, is, that is the metaphor to help us understand what it's going to be like when the spirit is poured on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. And they will spring up like grass and like willows and flowing streams. So let's go back to Miss Carol's question. Let's answer part of that now. Was, is, this, is this promise of the Holy Spirit to be fulfilled in Isaiah's time? How do we know? Because the opposite is what happened. <laughs> That's no fair. <laughs> can't, can't, can't answer that ex post. You gotta, like, how do we know from this passage? From a, how would a reader know? Yes. Uh, all the way back. Text two bears out. Yes. So there is this connection of the coming spirit and the coming servant. And so the servant, you know, all that was not coming in Isaiah's day. Uh, necessarily. Again, the reader would not have understood whether it was going to be 10 years or 700 years, as it turned out to be. But I would note that Isaiah does say, I will pour out my blessing on your offspring, verse 3, and on your descendants, verse 3. It, it, it would seem even, even to a casual reader that we're not talking about something that is imminent. Yes. 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 Good point. So they missed a lot of Roger's spiritual implications of this and caused cause them to miss Jesus, frankly, in a lot of ways. That's kind of a bigger theme we see through the New Testament. Uh, we didn't do these Yeah, that Jesus was the Messiah, but from their background, 
Appreciate that thought. Annie, did you have something you want to add? Yes. 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 That's, that's an excellent point. Joel, I think Joel helps us understand that too. That there was, this was a future pouring, a future um, new spirit that was, that was coming. Do you have something? And you can see, uh, Holly, when we were reading this, Holly pointed out the, the picture that he creates here. Verse 3, I'm going to pour out water like on a thirsty ground, streams on a dry ground. And then connected with that, what happens when you pour water out? Grass pops up, poplars begin to, to grow, they begin to fruit. And so it kind of uses that to say, what I'm going to do is going to be likened unto that, sandwiched in the middle of all that is this message. But I mean, you've seen that when you've got a bare spot and you water it and you put grass seed on it, and when it pops up, countless little blades of grass, and you just, there's millions of them. And you think to the Jews of the day of Jesus, it would have looked like this has been accomplished. I mean, there are, there are, we have grown in, in droves from where we were in exile, and we are still back in the land. And so there, there may have been a sense where they did look at this physically and said, you know, is this what God was, is, is this the, what God was talking about when he talked about he poured water on us and we've, we've sprung back to life? Okay. It may have, may have caused them to miss some of the things that he's talking about. Certainly not all of it, but good thought. Yes. Yes. So so Roger mentioned something else critical here that I think we should note, both from Isaiah and from Joel, that there is again it, it, probably easy to glide over if you were uh, uh, a Jew and knew yourself as God chosen people, but there's clearly indications here that this is a worldwide for Jew and Gentile pouring. I'll pour my spirit on all flesh, Joel 2. Um, the, the Gentiles are noted specifically in Isaiah 42. Um, so that, that is clearly a, a very different thing than, um, than what they were, what they understood and were used to uh, in the Old Testament. So I think that, that's a, an excellent note. Um, I had one other thing I was going to say. Let's go to, let's go to Ezekiel 37. Uh, maybe it'll come back to me. So there's a whole, a lot of these passages talk about a pouring of the Spirit. Oh, I remember as you're turning, a question I think is important. Was this rejuvenation from desolation to life, if you want to think about it like that, in, in, that, in that Isaiah uh, 44 kind of idea, this, this pouring of the Spirit that goes from this parched ground to this fruitful field, that transformation, was that for the spiritual nation of Israel that they were going to go from dead back to living? Or was that for individual believers that we're going to go from desolate back to fruitful? I think Ezekiel 37 really makes it clear that we're talking about, we're talking about national blessing. Now, we need to understand that as being... Is that nation growing to a nation is a spiritual nation? Yes, they spiritual have, Israel. Yeah. So, are these blessings talking about spiritual Israel going from desolation to life? I would answer that yes. Are there implications for individuals? I think for sure, right? Um, again, individually in, in Ezekiel 36, right? I'm going to put a, take out their heart of, heart of stone and put in them a heart of flesh and I'll put a new spirit in them. So in, individuals were going to be changed. Um, I would note there's a real interesting passage. I'll come to you, Annie. There's a real interesting passage in Ezekiel 36. What are the implications of the, of the new spirit in these people in Ezekiel 36? I think this is critical. comes right after he puts his spirit in them. What is that spirit going to accomplish in these individuals? What's that? Convict them? 
That, read the passage with me, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The, the impact, it appears from that verse, the implication, the impact of, of the spirit, this new spirit in these believers is the, is in some way the ability or the assistance in following the statutes. Help me make sense of that. Yes. 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 So, and Roger says it's all connected to following his word. I completely under, uh, agree and, and uh, would co-sign that. There is a note in Ezekiel 36 that this, this new spirit was going to, again, just going to read the, read the phrase, cause you to walk in my statutes. That's an interesting phrase. So, good thoughts. I'm going to add one verse from the New Testament that I think is interesting in this context. This idea, don't, I don't want us to get tripped up on this. I'm going to cause them to obey as if it's going to be some kind of overtaking of our will, robotic, zombie following of God's Word. Ask the question, can someone with the spirit of the world follow God's will? Here's what, here's what Paul would say about that in Romans chapter 8. Verse 6, the mind, the mind of the flesh, again, that whole, this whole chapter is talking about the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being guided by the Spirit. The mind on the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. That would make sense. That would, that would track with everything we've been reading, right? Desolation to, to life. Next verse, for the mind that is set on the flesh, if we have the Spirit of the world in us and not the Spirit of God in us, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Indeed, it cannot. It is an impossibility for, for the spirit of the world, right? That's how Old Testament writers would have described it in th their language. They have a spirit of the spirit of the world or the spirit of evil. Or if, if we're not led by God's spirit, but we're led by something different, we cannot submit to God's law. It is not compatible. There's an incompatibility with any other spirit any other mindset, any other attitude in us, rather than the Spirit of God. I, I connect that with, with that Ezekiel 36 passage. Why does it say, I will cause you to, to walk in my statutes? Because if we don't have this new spirit, this heart of flesh, this new spirit in us, walking, being guided by the Spirit, following God's law is an impossibility. It cannot, it cannot be accomplished. I think that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Yes? Yes. And so 
Yes. Yes, so, so the word, you know, the, the word in us, if, if, if we are not allowing ourselves to be guided by that, by that word, guided by the Spirit, if, if we don't have that Spirit in us, again, we cannot. It says it's an impossibility. Okay, I'm going to leave that with you because we got just a few minutes. Left. There's one last question I think is important here, and that, that's kind of the, the question in the middle of the page. If you strip away everything you knew about the New Testament— Tell me what, just in bullet points, what would you expect from a coming spirit as a first century or first century BC, perhaps, Jew? What do you expect? Let's, let's put aside for a minute this, this physical, spiritual issue that got too physical. But what, what, do you, what are the impact of this coming spirit? What do you expect the impact to be? You expect a king to be coming. Okay, what else? You expect restoration, no question. What else? You, bring justice. You, you expect justice. You expect life. You expect renewal. You expect to go from desolate to fruitful. It seems like that, again, what else? Help me here, what I'm missing. Prosperity. You, expect some, you expect prosperity. You expect renewal. You expect a deliverance. That's well said. Yeah, I think that, I think that tracks for sure. I would, I would just note, we'll talk more about this. There is nothing, in my judgment, even in Joel, which, which we mentally, we immediately go to Pentecost. We don't look at Joel in its own context. We just immediately see it through the lens of Pentecost because Peter says this is that, right? Even in Joel, I don't know that we see any expectation, any indication. They would not have expected the Spirit to come to perform miracles, they would not have expected the Spirit to come to allow them to speak in tongues. They would not have, like, all of these ideas that maybe the world thinks this is what the Spirit does. The Spirit allows us to work in miracles. The Spirit allows us to speak in tongues. The Spirit allows us to do miraculous things. There would have been, to, again, help me here, my reading, there would have been zero expectation of that. It would, it, it would, it's not even in the ballpark of what the Old Testament prophets indicate that the Spirit was coming to do. Any last thoughts or comments about that? So that's a good point. God always gives us more. The, the, the reality is more than the, the writers could, could describe. I would, I'd ask you to keep these two points in mind as we go through, the, especially the next few classes. They would have expected a coming king with the Spirit. They would have expected life and renewal and regeneration. That is what, in my judgment, the Old Testament prophets set, were telling the people to expect from the Spirit. Um, and then how does that relate to the Spirit's actual coming? That's the next four or five classes. We'll look at an Old Testament passage, and then we'll look at some of its New Testament fulfillment. Thanks, everybody, for their, uh, for their thoughts and their time this morning.